Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our special coverage of the launch of Artemis 1, heading back to the moon. I'm talking a little quietly here because, of course, my family is upstairs sleeping because of the late hour, but uh, thank you for joining us. It will be a late night, um, but hopefully we'll get to see this thing get off the ground. Um, I'm your host, Scott Young. I'm the planetarium astronomer at the Manitoba Museum here in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, in Treaty 1 territory, and we are eagerly watching all of the great stuff that is happening down at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. We have the huge Artemis 1 rocket on the pad, now almost fully fueled. Um, You can see the venting of the uh, super cold liquid hydrogen and oxygen venting out of there as it warms up a little bit and turns to gas. They vent out the, the gas so it doesn't build up pressure and then fill the tank back up. So there's this sort of ongoing replenishment that's going on right now. The timer there... And uh, Charles pointed this out in the thing. Uh, The timer there says uh, T minus 32 minutes and 25 seconds. What they're not pointing out is that at, when that gets to uh, T minus, uh, uh, let's see, T minus um, 10, 10 minutes, there is a 30 minute hold built in. And that's where they sort of go around the room and get the go, no go from everybody. So they're showing the countdown clock. That countdown clock will stop. The timer that I've got just above the Manitoba Museum logo on the uh, left of your screen there, that is time to the opening of the window. So it doesn't matter what is happening in terms of the countdown, whether it's delayed or whatever. That is the earliest time that they can launch to actually be on the right trajectory to the moon. So we are um, just over an hour away from the opening of the launch window. The launch window um, goes for two hours. Now, NASA has stated because of the delay in, in sending the red team out to the, out to the um, pad and, and doing the work there and now replenishing the fuel, they probably will not hit the very beginning of that two-hour window. They have not yet told us when they expect to be able to do that. So probably what will happen is we'll get to the hold and then the hold will be extended as necessary. So it's one of those things that we just have to sort of wait and see what happens. And it is definitely the kind of thing that uh, space launches are famous for. You, you know, this is launch attempt number four for, uh, for this particular rocket. They had a number of issues with, you know, brand, to, brand new technology. Uh, this is the most powerful rocket ever to go to the pad and it is uh, probably one of the most complicated machines ever it is certainly the heaviest um, vehicle ever to be put together Uh, in fact they hold the guinness world record for heaviest vehicle uh, ever to be moved and uh, they were just talking about that on the nasa tv channel this is the feed from nasa tv right there and uh, we'll also be checking in with um, uh, spaceflightnow.com, which is probably one of the best um, space uh, news sites. It, and it, because it's independent of any particular government body, they have a bit of independence there. They've got some uh, good commentary as well. So we'll be flipping back and forth there depending on, uh, on what's going on. Let's see here. Um, Charles has a question about Venus. Uh, Venus is not currently visible in the sky, so we're not uh, sort of in behind the sun right now, so not something we'll be, uh, we'll be looking for. Uh, let's see. I wanted to say a shout out to a few folks there. Um, oh, see, Randy is here. Hi, Tracy. Nice to see you. I don't want no scrub. Yeah, there's a song in there somewhere, I think. Hey, some, uh, was that, who was that? Was that Destiny's Child or was it Beyonce? I, Anyway, great, uh, great reference. That's, uh, that's pretty hilarious. Uh, I think you need to make a little video and send it into NASA. Uh, Steve's here. Nice to see you, Steve. And um, we said hi to Charles already. Uh, Dale, and uh, it's nice to see you all in the chat, checking in and so on. We've got uh, a number of folks that are just watching silently uh, as well, which is okay. Oh, hi, Vivian. Nice to see you. Um, Feel free to say hello or not. Not everybody wants to chat, but that's totally fine. We are hanging out 
and waiting for the um, details to come from NASA in terms of any updates that they might come to. Oh, hi. Hi, Miguel. And hi, Jay. Nice to see you. Um, let's see. Oh, Charles has a question about Mars. Yeah, we, we've got other planets in the sky right now. If you're into astronomy, um, actually this Thursday will be our Dome at Home show, which is where we're, we'll cover a lot of the things that are you know, up in the sky and so on. But uh, it's a great time to look at the sky because we've got the moon, we've got Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars all visible in the evening sky. Mars is coming into its brightest and uh, best for the year. So that's sort of one of the highlights. We'll be talking about that. And actually, if you're interested in Mars, the local astronomy club, uh, the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, uh, the Winnipeg Centre of that group, has their meeting on this coming Friday, the 18th. And that's available through their Facebook and uh, YouTube channel. And they have, um, let's see, Roger Venable, who is the Mars director for the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observator Observers. And he's basically going to talk all about Mars and its current, what we call it, its apparition, th this sort of season of Mars viewing. So that'll be good to, uh, to check out if you're into that. Oh, Terminator X, nice to see you. Okay. Very cool. Oh, uh, we have a name change. Okay, got it. Radiation Station 09. Very nice. Okay. Um, oh, hey, Hollis, nice to see you as well. Hollis from uh, down in Connecticut. And Ben. Oh, it's great. I'm glad that so many people are staying up late. I was really hoping that the launch would happen, you know, right at 12.04. And then, you know, it's, it's sort of 10 minutes of rocket launch stuff. And then they're in orbit. And then about 80 minutes later, they actually come over the, um, the region of North America again in their first orbit, and they fire the engine to go out to the moon. And we might be able to actually see that in the sky. Now, they're not probably going to launch right at the beginning of that window, and so all of those predictions that I looked at in advance are completely worthless now. We'll have to do some quick updates. But the plan here is we're going to stick, stick here, um, obviously, all the way through launch, all the way through um, the final burn to orbit. And then we will end this broadcast. I'll do some quick updates on, you know, what the visibility of the spacecraft will be, and we'll get those back out. And then if we're able to see it, and if the sky clears here, we will uh, go live again to try and actually see Artemis as it flies overhead. I've never seen a spacecraft that big before. I've seen the shuttle, I've seen the space station and things like that, but something going to the moon and actually firing its engines, never seen that. So I'm looking forward to that. All right, let's see. Yeah, Charles, it is overcast here right now, but it is actually supposed to clear about 1.30 and the burn happens about 2.11. Now I know that's cutting it close and weather forecasts can be uh, inaccurate, but we can hope. Uh, Jay, this rocket is not manned. There are no humans aboard. There are a number of basically crash test dummies. There's a sort of a full astronaut crash test dummies um, called uh, Commander Munikin Campos is his name. There are two other sort of just torsos that have radiation sensors and, and uh, accelerometers and things like that to measure the stresses on a human body. And there's also... Uh, a Snoopy doll. And um, there's, it's sort of a tradition that you hang a stuffed animal from the top of uh, the control panel on a string. And when you're on the ground, it just hangs there. And when you're flying, the, when the rocket engine is burning, it's basically pulled straight down because of the acceleration of the engine. But then when the engines turn off and you're in space, you're in zero gravity and suddenly that stuffed animal just starts floating around. And so it's, it's, colloquially referred to as the zero G indicator, but, uh, the, uh, peanuts folks actually made a custom Snoopy, uh, with a properly designed and fully functional spacesuit for Snoopy, just in case there's any kind of issue. So we'll watch for that as well on, uh, on board. Uh, all right, let's see. I think what we're going to do is, uh, for those of you that haven't seen, um, sort of what we're expecting today. We're going to just take a look at what we can expect from the Artemis mission. There we go. 
So there is uh, the rocket. Um, it may look familiar to you if you've been watching the space program for a while. It is uh, the kind of thing... Oh, let me see here. There we go. Um, it's the kind of thing that uses a lot of old... Um, Tech, older technology, space shuttle main engines, the space shuttle orange tank, the side boosters and things like that, but obviously updated and modified for um, everything that's able to do now. The rocket takes off. You get this massive launch. And I've seen a shuttle launch once. I've been at the, sh the pad a couple of times when it didn't launch, but uh, I have seen the one launch and it is spectacular. And this is going to be you know, basically the same level of, of noise and volume and impressiveness. The rocket spends about two minutes pump, pumping out of the upper atmosphere, and uh, those solid rocket boosters doing a lot of the work to get this gigantic thing sort of up through the very dense part of the atmosphere. And then we have um, Basically, uh, a period just after two minutes into flight, those solid rocket boosters have burned all of their fuel in only two minutes, and they drop away, and the rest of the rocket continues. So basically, it's dropped off the, uh, the extra weight of these now empty rockets. And then the uh, four uh, main engines keep firing. At this point, they're out of the atmosphere. They can get rid of some of the shields. The, um, the emergency eject system and things like that is no longer required. And the Orion spacecraft at the nose there becomes fully exposed. And you can see the, the, the conical uh, crew cabin at the front. And there's some solar panels on the side. About um, 10 minutes into flights, the sort of second stage pops away and they get rid of that giant fuel tank. This uh, s second stage is the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion System, or the ICPS. It's a sort of a temporary filler system because the second stage for uh, the Artemis program is not fully complete yet, but it's enough to lift an empty Orion spacecraft and fire it on trajectory to the moon. And so that allows us uh, to basically make this trip. And the uh, Artemis 1 mission will basically take us all the way out to the moon. We'll enter orbit around the moon. The um, Orion spacecraft will loop down to about 100 miles uh, above the surface. There will be spectacular images of the moon up close, of the Earth in space. And I've got to say, NASA has really upped their... Um, publicity game. The, the, during the shuttle era, they tended to do things kind of very bare bones and, and not really have the resources to jazz it up, but they've got sort of full color commentary going on throughout the whole mission, which will be really, really cool. Uh, let's see. Um, oh, hey, Melissa, nice to see you. Way out in the West, it's not quite as late for you, I guess, which is, which is uh, the advantage of being out there. Um, the question, do you know the conditions required for twilight phenomenon? Um, what twilight phenomenon are you, uh, are you referring to? I'm not quite sure. Um, uh, oh, and hi, Kevin. Nice to see you. I, yeah, you, for you guys out East, it's even, it's even earlier. I was talking uh, to, uh, or seeing my friend Chris from Astronomy by the Bay out in New Brunswick, and for him, the launch is at 2.04, so uh, very, very early. Um, let's see. So right now, we still don't have uh, a fi an official time that is different. Um, the countdown is proceeding at, we're at T minus 19 minutes and 12 seconds or so. And that's me reading the internet. So that's about 10 seconds behind is what I find the lag is right now. That will stop at T minus 10 minutes where we go into a planned 30 minute hold. They will probably extend that hold. So we do not know exactly when the launch will, will go, but um, we'll have to see exactly what that, um, 
what that happens. That hold will be at least 30 minutes because the window doesn't open, the launch window doesn't open until um, almost 50 minutes from, from now, 47 minutes or something like that. So that makes it, um, you know, they can't just sort of skip ahead. They have to wait until the opening of that window. And that's what the, uh, that's what the blue countdown over on, uh, on the left of the screen is. Let's pop back to our main launch window here. A great view of the business end of the space launch system. The four space shuttle main engines in the center there, and then the two towering uh, solid rocket boosters on the side, all from the shuttle era. In fact, some, uh, all four of those space shuttle main engines flew on various space shuttle missions. They're not brand new, so they've been well tested um, every time they come back, they're refurbished, and they've actually been fired uh, on the ground here in test as well. And the solid rocket boosters also get tested before they uh, before they go. They can't they can't fuel them, test them, and then launch them again. They have to refuel them. But there's a whole process on on making those things work. So um, there it is. It's a pretty impressive uh, rocket. We, uh, we have a display down in the Science Center by our planetarium down at the Manitoba Museum where uh, we have some various model rockets and a model of the museum all to scale. And our museum is, is uh, six stories of um, everything from offices to vaults, uh, collections, labs, and all that kind of stuff. So six stories. And um, this rocket is uh, about three or four times the size uh, in terms of height, the rear end of the of the rocket is basically about as big around as our planetarium dome is. So if you're from Winnipeg or you've been to our planetarium, that's an 18.3 meter, 60 foot dome, um, pretty cavernous building when you're inside it. So that's the kind of scale that we're talking about. It, it just doesn't come through on these uh, these wonderful um, images of the of the camera. You just don't get the sense of scale. They did have the crew walking around out there and you could hardly see the people down at the bottom of that rocket. Just off to the right, you might notice a pillar of flame. Don't be disturbed by that. Oh, we just cut away, of course. That's uh, the hydrogen that is um, being vented out of the tank so that it doesn't overpressurize. They take that away in some pipes and then they burn it off in a, in a stack there. And so that's part of the, uh, of the system of just keeping the rocket fully fueled and um, ready to go as they go through some of these other systems and so on. Let's see. Oh, the, uh, okay, I've got uh, Melissa's uh, response here. The, the exhaust plume, which is suspended against the dark sky and then illuminated. And yeah, there was some really cool, when a rocket launches, it's got the exhaust, of course. And as it goes through the air, it's moving so fast it can pressurize the air, which can sometimes cause cloud formations, which can actually be really, really beautiful. Um, especially when the launch times out that you're launching right at sunrise or uh, right at sunset where the light is just starting to change and it's you know dark here on the ground, but illuminated up a little bit higher. For this launch, we're launching you know, at one in the morning Florida time. So pretty dark. Probably not. The oh, I'm just getting an update here. Hold, uh, stand by. When it hits 10 minutes, or 45 minutes until the opening of the launch window this morning here at Kennedy Space Center. No official update yet from the launch team on whether they expect to be able to hit the top of the window. or whether the launch time could be pushed back uh, later into the two-hour window this morning. So there we heard from uh, the firing room there that um, everything is still officially on track for the beginning of the launch window. We haven't heard, although it took about 45 minutes for them to, to identify the hydrogen leak when they were tanking earlier in the day to get a crew out there to literally go up to this rocket, which is full of 500,000 gallons of highly explosive fuel, and basically crank it down with a wrench to tighten it up. Pretty, uh, pretty brave thing. There, there's a, 
they were the only people allowed within 400 meters of the rocket because that's the blast zone. Oh, we're just getting something else from Mission Control. Oh, no, no update. So we're going to watch the countdown clock click down to uh, T minus 10 minutes, and then we'll enter that planned hold. So it sounds like the uh, first stage of the rocket is still is fully fueled, which they've sort of made up all of the, the time from the leak. Uh, but the second stage is only 75% fueled, so they still have some work to go on that. So that'll probably push us back, I would guess, a half an hour. But we'll have to see. Um, they were working another problem, which was the... Um, one of the radars that they use to track the rocket as it goes up failed. They, not the radar itself, but communications to that radar. And it turned out that there was a bad Ethernet switch. So literally the same kind of problem you might have with your home internet, uh, NASA's dealing with that. And, and they estimated it would be a 70-minute fix. And I like to imagine that half of that time is somebody basically driving to Radio Shack to buy a new piece. It's not Radio Shack anymore, I know, but I grew up with Radio Shack. Um, and drive back and plug it back in, because, I mean, swapping out an Ethernet switch is not a, not a huge deal. But um, they are uh, working away on that, and that should be done. Actually, it's probably already done. We haven't got a report back on that, but that was planned to be done before they went into the, uh, the uh, planned hold at T-10. So that's coming up in uh, just a little bit under two minutes here. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> now there is uh, some visibility of the rocket if you're in the Florida area uh, or a little bit up the east coast, but this rocket does launch pretty much straight east out over the ocean, and so you really don't get um, much opportunity to see it on the way out. It actually launches sort of north of east, and it does go over Europe. So anybody watching from Europe... You can certainly um, get out there and, and watch for it. Um, we here in North America will have to wait until it makes it all the way around, which will probably take 90 minutes or so, and maybe a little bit less than that. And that will give us the opportunity to um, potentially see it in the sky. Oh, hey, James. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, we want to get this thing going. Uh, it would be very nice. We're just about to, just about to head into the planned hold at T minus 10. So let's go back to our um, our little sim here of the, hey, what happened? Oh, that's unfortunate. Let's just go back to here. In a very abbreviated sense, we, we get the you know, the, the solid rocket boosters fall off. The whole thing gets up into, into orbit. The Orion spacecraft unfolds its solar arrays about 18 minutes after launch. We probably won't be broadcasting all the way through that, but NASA TV, uh, which you can catch on NASA TV, uh, will be um, broadcasting that, and hopefully we'll get to see some camera views of that as well. This is what I'm really looking forward to, the view of the earth rising behind the moon. That was one of the f most famous images of the, the Apollo era back in Apollo 8. And then of course, this is the main test of Artemis 1 to make sure the crew capsule can come back at that high speed from that distance and come back through the atmosphere safely and bring the astronauts home. Hence the crash test dummies on board and they'll provide all the information we need to know that Artemis is safe. And once that thing splashes back down, the clock starts ticking for Artemis 2. And Artemis 2, for me, is the one that I'm really interested in seeing, because Artemis 2, first of all, will have people on board, but it will have, let's see here, 
It will have three American astronauts and one Canadian astronaut. Now, we don't know for sure which Canadian astronaut will be tapped for that. We have four currently active Canadian astronauts. We've got uh, David Saint-Jacques, who just got back from the International Space Station six-month mission. It's probably not going to be him. Um, we've got his backup for that mission, Jeremy Hansen, and that's who my money is on for the uh, Artemis II mission, just because he's sort of the next in line. Um, and then we have uh, the two new folks. There's Jenny Seide and Josh Kutrick. Um, it could be either of them as well, although I suspect that they'll probably be saved for the, the next Canadian seat because as part of our contributions to the Artemis program, we actually have two seats on upcoming Artemis missions. One of them is on Artemis II, which goes all the way around the moon. It doesn't land, but it does, in fact, um, go all the way around. And so that will be a pretty... Basically, it's like the Apollo 8 mission, um, and it will be a, a pretty impressive... Uh, experience, I think, with great views. Artemis 3 is the l one that lands. And Artemis 3 will carry, um, according to NASA, the first woman and the first person of color to the surface of the moon, which uh, will be kind of nice. And it will also mark the first sort of sustainable traveling to the moon, because it's not just going to the moon, landing, picking up some rocks, and coming back. It's building a space station in orbit around the moon that you can use for trips back and forth. That space station is called Gateway, and that's where Canada's participation kicks in. Uh, Gateway is a um, kind of like a mini international space station with a Canada arm on it that is used to put the whole thing together and to help dock the uh, robotic cargo vehicles and to dock things like the new lunar lander that will be built. Now, it sounds like the lunar lander is actually going to be um, SpaceX's Starship spacecraft. We, that has not successfully really flown anywhere yet, and uh, they can't really get it into orbit yet, so we're not sure what the timing on that will be. But uh, that's the plan anyway. And because we're building the Canada Arm 3, uh, I suspect that we will also be sending astronauts to the Gateway Space Station. Uh, and once you're at Gateway, it's very easy to just go down to the moon and come back because you don't, you don't have to worry about coming all the way back to, to the Earth. And so uh, I have high hopes that we will see Canadian feet on the moon sometime in the 2020s. Uh, James, Artemis II is currently scheduled for 2024. That seems uh, quite a ways away, but it is... Um, that's, that's what they're saying. So we'll have to see exactly when that, uh, when that takes place. Of course, it all hinges on what happens today with Artemis 1. So we're in a uh, planned 30-minute hold. The launch window opens in 35 minutes. And so we should be able to um, hear from NASA in the next little while exactly when they are going to be um, launching or if, if they're going to change their their target launch time they are still refueling the top stage uh, after they had to stop to fix that leak and uh, there's still that radar to be fixed uh, let's see uh, Melissa is asking how long does it take to watch the launch until it's out of view oh um, so you can see the spacecraft until it's at about 40,000 feet which um, only takes a couple of minutes. When I watched the space shuttle, uh, it was a night launch, and so you couldn't see the rocket, but you could see the flames from the engines, and we could actually see, um, you know, it, it went up into the air, and we could see the solid rocket boosters come off, and at that point, it just became three little um, sort of bluish-purple flames um, actually just like little dots. And, th and as it got farther and farther away, it just sort of turned into this bluish purple star that was slowly moving like, like a satellite did. And then it basically moved down over the horizon. And we, we saw it for about five minutes or so. Uh, this is also a night launch. So um, people should be able to see the spacecraft until it goes over the horizon, which will probably take about the same amount of time. 
it is um, very, very fast, really. Um, if you think about just how big this thing is, even just moving the length of the, of the rocket, which is 300 feet or so, um, in a couple of seconds, is already going that fast when, it, when the, the rocket just launches. And as soon as it gets up past the tower, we sort of lose any reference to sort of see how fast it's going. So we have to depend on those numbers that uh, usually NASA sort of puts up as a little speedometer on the, on the uh, screen. But incredibly fast. And uh, to get into orbit, we're talking about getting up to uh, a speed of around uh, 40,000 kilometers an hour. So let's see, 40,000 kilometers an hour is like a thousand times as fast as your car goes if you're sort of driving down a residential street. That's pretty fast. All right, let's see here. I wanted to get to a little bit back to our look at Artemis 3. They've already started looking at where Artemis 3 will land. And the goal here is to land at the south pole of the moon. All the Apollo missions landed kind of in the middle of the moon as viewed from the Earth, kind of in the equator area, because that was the easiest area to get to. Now that we have more powerful spacecraft, we're not operating right at the limit of our abilities here. We can pick a more interesting or more useful place to land. And so it turns out the South Pole is a really good place if you want a permanent moon base. Because in some of these craters here, some of these craters never see the sun. And so there's actually places there where there is ice frozen. On the rest of the surface of the moon, you know, at some point the sun rises and it takes the temperature up, a, you know, 100 degrees or 200 degrees or so. And then at night it goes down to minus 150 or something like that. At the bottom of those craters, the sun never gets in there because it's always coming at an angle like this and the crater wall blocks it. And you've got these deposits of ice, which is just frozen water. Water is the most useful thing if you're setting up a, a base on another planet. First of all, you drink it, you use it for cooling, you split it in half, um, and you basically make it into hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen is rocket fuel, and oxygen is the stuff that rocket fuel needs to burn. And so you basically have all the things that you need already right there. It means you don't have to bring a spacecraft with a big water tank attached to it. You can get your water there. So that's what they're, they're looking at, and they're sort of looking at these different zones here. And I'm sure there's all sorts of engineering and scientific reasons for choosing um, one over another. I'm not really sure, but I mean, they all are right, right around the South Pole and right in those areas where those ice craters uh, are likely. So we'll have to see as we get closer and have, as the, the lunar lander um, takes shape, because I'm sure whatever the spacecraft is will have some bearing on exactly where they can land. Gateway is just a little, a little uh, spacecraft here. It's not as big as the International Space Station, but it does have some common sort of hardware. And it does have on the right there an Orion spacecraft. It's got a, its own solar arrays. It goes around the moon, but it doesn't stay close to the moon. It doesn't stay in a circle around the moon. It sort of goes in this long sloping oval orbit so it spends some time very close to the moon and then it comes almost a third of the way back towards the earth and so that's that means the, you don't have to fly all the way to the moon anymore you can fly two-thirds of the way and then just uh, hook up with the gateway and then ride the gateway back towards the moon and just stay there and then whenever you want to go down to the moon you just wait for it for gateway to get close to the moon and then you just hop in your little landing craft and pop down and uh, spend some time there and then you can come back. So it's actually a much better way to, you know, go to the moon with the intention to, to stay there for long periods. I mean, Apollo was great. It really pushed a lot of technologies. It forced us to do things that nobody had ever done before, but it was really kind of dead end. It's like, okay, we planted the flag, we got the rocks, and now 
we can do it again. But there was no way to sort of build that into something more useful. Each, each Apollo mission, and they had actually scheduled them all the way up to Apollo 20, was basically, let's land in a slightly different place and pick up slightly different rocks. Um, and I mean, there, I'm, I'm simplifying it, obviously, but there was a lot of... Um, a lot of discussion about, you know, at what point is this not worth doing anymore? And uh, they wound up cutting Apollo 20 and then Apollo 18 and 19 as well. So the last moon mission, Apollo 17, was back in 1972. So we're, we're like 50 years on from the last time humans went back to the moon. And so it's kind of cool that we're now sitting here waiting for the first test flight of the next generation of moon landings to uh, to occur. So the folks on uh, NASA TV and on spaceflight are basically just filling time at this point because NASA has not announced any of their um, any updates or anything like that. There's, uh, if you uh, want to check out some of the other broadcasts, NASA TV has uh, some, actually some pretty impressive um, explanation material in terms of, you know, here's how, how the rocket works and here's what the mission is like. They've got uh, uh, an astronaut sitting there. She's, uh, Kayla Barron is, is in the, the group of folks that may fly on Artemis too. And uh, they're doing a pretty good job of, you know, talking about and making it sound exciting, as opposed to some of those shuttle launches where in the days it was just, I mean, very sort of mechanical. And, and they weren't really, it was, it's hard to get excited about some of those, some of those missions, even though that's, I was excited about them because that, that was my space program, right? That's, that's all I knew. I, uh, I was just a baby when the uh, Apollo missions finished up, so... Uh, James is asking, uh, then Gateway's orbit is longer time-wise. Yeah, you know, I think it's actually, it's, is it two weeks? Like, it takes a long time to do a full loop around the moon. It's, it, it sort of zooms past the moon fairly quickly and then goes out fairly slowly and then comes back in. And, but it's, it's quite a long orbital period. So it's not like, you know, like the International Space Station goes around the Earth every 90 minutes. Uh, that's because it's basically close the whole time. So the, you sort of trade off the, uh, the convenience of the rapid time in order to get the sort of closer uh, distance from Earth. So we'll have, to, uh, we'll have to see how well that works. There's a spacecraft that they sent to uh, just check that out, and it just entered orbit last week. And so it'll be basically taking that same gateway orbit and testing out communications and testing, you know, make, you know, taking measurements and things like that to sort of prove that the, the orbit is a good one to use before we commit to building a space station there. Okay. So this is, uh, this is space flight now, and th they're actually taking, um, mostly they're just dealing with the various cameras around the launch pad. There are dozens of cameras at every possible angle around the launch pad. And some of them, the engineers at, in mission control can actually drive around with a joystick and zoom in on things. When, when I was watching this afternoon, you could, they were, they were zooming in really close and focusing the cameras on the bolts and the connectors on the, uh, the umbilicals and things like that. So they had these really close up views of, you know, this tube coming out of a rocket with venting hydrogen. So really, really close up views. That was, that was pretty cool. Um, and, uh, we're still holding at T minus 10 minutes. We've got, uh, about 14 minutes before that countdown clock should start up again. Um, we are still waiting though for NASA to give us the details there. Now, during this hold, this is when the launch director, um, will basically do their poll where they go around the room and they say, um, are we go or not, or no go? And they will ask each, um, team member, you know, and, and this is, you know, if you've seen Apollo 13, it's like guidance, go. Um, tell them you go and they go through the whole thing and one no go will stop the launch. So if there's something that is 
not working, that's the time for them to sort of call, make the decision on it. But that's coming up in about, uh, well, they should be doing that in about eight minutes or so, although I, I'm sure that the, the launch director is, is already conducting some of those um, discussions in view of the fact that we had to delay for the, the fuel leak and also the status of that, of that radio. Ooh, Steve, good question. Um, thinking like an observer, I love it. Um, when Gateway is in orbit, can it be seen by a telescope when it's closest to Earth? You know, I think it, I'm pretty sure it will be. Um, maybe even in binoculars. Um, this is the kind of thing that, um, you know, watching satellites and things like that around the Earth, we've, we sort of know those orbits fairly well, and you can sort of think, based on how big something is, whether it'll be visible or whether it'll be too faint. But in this uh, unique orbit, I'm not sure off the top of my head, but I think that with a big pair of solar panels like that, with quite a bit of reflecting area, I think that we should be able to see it. The question will be, will it be so close to the moon that the moon's brightness will make it hard to see? So it'll depend on the angles and things like that. So I suspect we'll have an opportunity to see it, but maybe not all the time. We're just getting something from uh, Space Flight now, so I'm going to flip to them here. ...would be used to destroy or blow up the rocket if it flew off course after launch. The range, the eastern range here at Cape Canaveral is charged with public safety. They're responsible for ensuring uh, the uh, minimal risk uh, from a rocket launch to public safety. And one of the ways, the main way they do that is all these rockets that launch from the Cape have a flat termination system. This, uh, these include pyrotechnics on the rocket that would uh, blow up the rocket if it threatened any populated areas. So the testing of that system and the range's ability to send a manual destruct command to the rocket is set to begin soon. So we're still waiting on a a uh, word from NASA for a new target launch time. And uh, I suspect that, you know, it took about 45 minutes for them to sort of identify the leak, send the red team out there, tighten down the valve. They did some work on both the lower stage and the upper stage, and then to clear the pad. And so basically during that time, they couldn't be replenishing the fuel tanks. And so some of the fuel vaporized and was vented out and so they they had to sort of catch up on on tanking those things back up i think we are now back at a a system where um they are pretty much at close to 100 percent, but then they have to continue the rest of the countdown i suspect that we'll be aiming for a, a launch uh, probably in the 12 30 central time range maybe even as late as 12 45 but we'll have to see now, the only concern, the weather looks really good right now, but the um, clouds are expected to get a little bit thicker towards the end of the launch window, which would be around 2 o'clock our time. If we push all the way to the launch window end, we may run into some weather issues. They, they don't like flying through a lot of thick clouds, um, not only for visibility points of view, but also as a rocket goes through a lot of water vapor, it can trigger its own lightning. And obviously lightning hitting a rocket is never something you really want to see. Uh, that happened during the Apollo mission. Um, Apollo 12, the, um, were, they were, uh, it was raining and they went ahead and launched anyway, uh, which normally isn't a problem, but there was enough charge that was built up and the rocket's exhaust basically grounded the rocket to the ground. And so um, a minute into launch, the Apollo 12 spacecraft was hit by lightning twice and the lightning hit the spacecraft and then rode the exhaust plume all the way down to the ground and hit the pad. Um, it fried their computer and suddenly you've got this gigantic rocket and nothing is steering it. Um, luckily, 
there was basically a way to sort of reset everything quickly that just sort of cleared out the problem. It didn't permanently do any damage. And luckily, an engineer in uh, mission control knew what to do and made the call up to the spacecraft. And one of the astronauts knew what that call meant because it was one of those things that you almost never would have to do. So it's like, I don't know, it's like changing a fuse in your car or something like that. Something that you almost almost never deal with. Well, he happened to remember it and was able to do it fast enough before they went too far off course and the mission was saved. Would have been a very different space program if that lightning strike had basically caused a, a major accident and um, could have happened. So ever since then, NASA has been had a lot of mission rules about lightning. Um, yeah, it was absolutely crazy. Um, if you've ever seen, uh, Tom Hanks did a great series, after Apollo 13, he did a, a series on the Apollo program called From the Earth to the Moon. And it's basically one TV uh, episode on each Apollo mission. And the Apollo 12 one gets into that whole thing. It was really, really well done. You should def definitely check that out if you haven't seen it. It's a great history, the Apollo program. Um, and uh, it it dramatizes that whole sequence and uh, the, 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 the Apollo 12 crew, they were all uh, Navy um, aircraft carrier or test pilots. And so they were you know, sort of joking around about, well, it's a Navy crew, it's raining and we, we don't mind getting wet. It's no big deal. Let's just go. Um, and then the lightning hit. All right. Uh, still nothing coming in from NASA. I was kind of hoping that they would make an announcement, but uh, that's okay. Um, Oh, here's, the, here's another question from Melissa. Um, why has nobody visited the moon in so long? Politics, funding, competing priorities, all of the above. Um, it is hard to go to the moon. Now, getting into space is becoming easier. There are more potential ways to do it. The rocket costs are coming down and stuff like that. Um, I mean, if you're a, a university or even a well-funded individual, who wants to put something in space for a few minutes, you can buy a sounding rocket off the shelf for a couple hundred thousand dollars that will get you into space for a few minutes. Um, if you have $10 million, you can buy a seat up to the International Space Station through the Russians. So, um, you know, those, it's still not accessible for most of us, but those things are becoming more accessible. Going to the moon, though, is a whole nother kettle of fish because not just the distance you have to have a huge spacecraft that can get a huge spacecraft into orbit because you really need two spacecraft you need a spacecraft that takes you to the moon and you need a, need a second spacecraft that lifts that lunar spacecraft off the earth and gets it out of the earth's gravity field so it's a big issue and then the problem is if something goes wrong you're not just you know a parachute ride away from the ground. I mean, if you're on the International Space Station, you're 400 kilometers up. And if there's something bad, like, you know, uh, depressurization or a fire or something like that, you can get in your escape lifeboat and cut loose and be back on the ground in 20 or 30 minutes. From the moon, you could be three or four days away from home. And so you have to be very, very self-sufficient. This is kind of why I'm a little concerned about some of the private companies that are talking about going to the moon. Um, the SpaceX already has a plan for a lunar trip with their Starship spacecraft. And um, we'll see how, uh, how they handle the requirements for self-reliance. I mean, NASA does it by doing a huge amount of time-consuming and expensive testing before launching. We'll see how SpaceX sort of solves that problem. But the moon is a very complicated thing to get to. And it got done, you know, the, the Americans did it. And other countries sort of would like to do it. But right around the time that the Apollo missions were finishing, the idea of having robotic explorers really started to come into its own. So it wasn't only that, you know, the, the politics and the cost and then competing priorities, as you, as you say, those are all certainly a part of it. But suddenly it became possible to send a, ro a robot 
And while it wouldn't do as good a job as an astronaut walking around on the moon, they were getting better all the time. And actually now we're at the point where arguably if you want moon rocks or you want to do geology about the moon, it's way better to just send a little rover with a robot arm and a drill and, you know, they're, they're, they're becoming so, um, so effective that the idea of sending people to do that job on the moon is kind of not even worth considering anymore. And so that's why, you know, the, the idea of doing things on the moon is actually becoming more about sustainability, about uh, creating a long-term presence, and then also doing big science on the moon, like building a radio telescope that, that is shielded from all of the radio noise that we all have uh, all over the Earth. It's actually very hard, if you're a radio astronomer, to filter out all the static and all the cell phone noises and all the microwave uh, popcorn um, radiation waves and things like that from your science data. So if you put your radio telescope on the moon, on the far side of the moon, you suddenly can study the universe with unprecedented um, clarity. Kind of like the, the uh, James Webb Space Telescope. You know, it's nice and far away and it's on the far side of the Earth from the sun and so on. And it's in that, it, that special orbit. Um, that's what the moon is like. And so the moon is a perfect place to build uh, observatories. So it'll be more that big science, but it is expensive and it is uh, challenging. Despite that, a bunch of countries are saying they're growing. Uh, Russia and China have a new joint lunar program they're working on. India has announced the uh, uh, goal of landing uh, astronauts on the moon. They've already, you know, got uh, orbiters and, and they're building up their space program as well. Lots of really, really good stuff. So uh, we'll see. I think, I think it'll be cool to see what the next 10 years or so brings. Okay, let me just make sure I'm getting all of the... Uh, there we go. Okay. Oh, see you later, J-Dub. Um, sleep. Yes, you can sleep, I guess. But it is uh, one of those things that uh, you'll be able to watch tomorrow. I mean, either it will launch and you can watch the rerun, or you can get up in the morning and hear that it got delayed for another couple of days. All righty. I'm still waiting to hear from NASA. We are uh, less than a minute away from where the countdown was planned to pick up. I'm pretty sure that they're not going to, but we still haven't heard when we will. I'm going to just uh, have to reconfigure a couple of things on the audio side of my of my board here. So I'm going to just uh, leave you with NASA TV for a couple of minutes. And they're doing some interviews of folks that are there. And uh, so th they'll keep you entertained while I just do a little bit of audio work here. Let's make sure you have the audio. <laughs> that was amazing. There we go. Uh, and that's just uh, I'll be back uh, with you, you know, shortly. people who, who were actually able to come here to Florida. There's many uh, people who are joining us from around the world who couldn't obviously make the trip out here. Uh, so let's take a look at some of those watch parties there. Here's Space Center Houston. It's the visitor center over uh, for Johnson Space Center in Houston. And you can see a lot of people there after hours because you know that visitor center is closed right now people are waving i love it wow look at that whatever that is <laughs> it's awesome. amazing i don't think i've ever noticed that when i'm at space center houston maybe it's new i know <laughs> uh but yeah just look at that crowd it's really fun to see again all all these people who are captivated young and old by today's launch attempt and the beginning of the artemis program uh i know that they're uh, uh probably looking at the clock and and uh wondering when we might see the launch today so lovely to see all those people And there's the Space and Rocket Center, uh, where we have a ton of people <laughs> waving their flags, <laughs> cheering us on tonight for this incredible launch this evening. I love that. They totally look like cheerleaders, and I, they're embracing it. I love it. Uh, and yeah, this is the U.S. Space and Rocket Center. This is the Visitor Center over in Huntsville, Alabama. As I've said before, uh, this uh, that... Uh, um, 
Marshall Space Flight Center there is uh, super instrumental uh, in uh, what uh, what the Artemis program is doing. They uh, uh, contributed a lot to the mission, so it's nice to see everyone there. And then here is Airbus in Bremen, Germany. So Airbus is the main contractor for the European Space Agency, and together the company and ESA, they provided the European Service Module, which is uh, an important part of the Orion spacecraft. So we have quite a bit of people there, uh, a more reasonable time over there in <laughs> Germany. It is 7 a.m., so I'm going to say uh, Guten Morgen to them. Did I say it right? <laughs> Guten Morgen to them over there uh, in Bremen, Germany. Again, the Airbus company. All right, so let's get another check on the launch team with our Daryl Nail, who's inside there and has an update for us. Yeah, that's right, Megan. So we are uh, clearly in a delay now. The NASA test director, who's basically flying the ship, for the launch countdown tonight has said that uh, we are extending the hold that we were currently in at T minus 10 minutes and counting. And so that puts us off the 1.04 a.m. Eastern time launch. We're now slipping indefinitely into the hold. And NASA uh, test director Carlos Monge saying that uh, we are currently um, estimating how much work needs to be done before resuming <coughs> Uh, the polling that uh, is supposed to take place 15 minutes before launch. It then goes to terminal count at T minus 10 minutes. Now we've got an update on the tanking of the upper stage liquid hydrogen tank. Currently 95% filled. We're in topping on that tank. It is the last of four tanks in the space launch system that filled. needed to be in completely fueled up it is before the last we launch. Of four tanks of course, cryogenic tank in the space the launch system operation that has seen some delays tonight. We had a roughly hour delay uh, after a replenish valve on the core stage liquid hydrogen side required hands-on work by a red crew team that went out to the launch pad and tightened down some bolts on the valve uh, and got it fixed before leaving the launch pad and uh, then uh, launch team verifying that that work was complete. Now currently we're awaiting some work with the range. Uh, the 45th Space Wing, which oversees the range here, makes sure that uh, the airspace and, uh, and uh, the ocean out over the flight path is clear and also has the responsibility to destruct the rocket should it go uh, off track. Uh, they have been working on some issues with their equipment and sending a flight termination signal to the rocket. That, that uh, uh, there is testing that must happen with the flight termination system that was delayed by a bad ethernet switch. Switch has been changed out, and now uh, the range is looking to start testing their connectivity to the rocket uh, in order to preserve that uh, safety function uh, that they are responsible for. So again, we are slipping now indefinitely into the launch window. Um, we're awaiting uh, the uh, launch team to evaluate just how much time is required to complete the work to get this rocket ready to launch. And of course, when we have a new T-0 for you, we'll report that out right away. Megan, back to you. Daryl, thank you so much. As NASA prepares to explore the moon, here's a look at the spacesuits and tools that will help us to do that. Watching Apollo footage of astronauts doing geology on the surface of the moon is a really great way to think about preparing for Artemis, for putting people on the lunar surface once again. We learn a lot in how they did science operations on the moon and what it's like to work on the moon. You see them doing geology. You see them taking rock samples, putting in a drive tube to take a core sample. You see them bouncing along the surface of the moon on the lunar rover that they used in Apollo 15 through 17. So it's a great way to help drive technology development for the next generation of spacesuits and geology sampling tools. There's these facilities that help us train like we are on the lunar surface. You 
know, these 1-6G offload systems or putting people in the aquatic environment are great ways to train the mobility part, right? Like what can you do and how different does it feel to be in 1-6G and do these tasks? We've been training astronauts in geology and geoscience for decades now. The Apollo astronauts had literally hundreds of hours of training in geology before they flew to the moon. It's often said that the Apollo astronauts had the equivalent of a master's degree in geology by the time they flew to the moon. In the intervening decades since Apollo, we've been training astronauts who fly to the International Space Station because when they're on the ISS, they spend time observing the Earth looking out the window, taking pictures of what they see on the Earth's surface. Now that we're looking at putting astronauts on the surface of the moon, we also take them into the field. We take them to field sites here on Earth that resemble field sites that we expect them to see on the moon. That's the reason why we take them out into places that are unique, like volcanic landscapes or places that are analogous to the lunar surface to train them on the scale and fidelity of science that you just can't recreate in these facilities. And so by combining this classroom and field training, we're able to prep them for fundamentals of geology, the major driving lunar science questions that we have that we hope to address with the Artemis program and teaching them how to do field work in relevant analog environments. For just science aspects of developing new spacesuits, can it get you to where you need to go and then once you get there can you do the cool science that you need to do and so that's can you move effectively and efficiently in the suit to be able to collect the samples or use the tools or the instruments for the visibility it's like can you make the necessary observations that you need to or does the suit have the lights on it that it needs to to illuminate the surface and make the observations you need to the Lunar South Pole holds tremendous resources that are gonna allow us to, to continue to explore. This is, this is a place that we've never been before. There's so much to be learned from getting boots on the ground and exploring a unique place that challenges us as humans and also helps us develop technologies that make our everyday life that much better. We think there might be volatiles present at the South Pole. By using these volatiles, we'll be able to do things like create drinking water, create rocket fuel to launch astronauts back to Earth. And so by harnessing the power of the land, we'll be able to help astronauts establish that long-term sustainable presence. It's human nature to explore. Pushing our boundaries and exploring our universe is, I think, just one of those things that's just stuck in our human nature and that we need to do it in order to understand the world around us, including our Earth and our solar system. So there we have some cool stuff from NASA TV in terms of what's going on. Back to live views of the... Uh, of the rocket there and uh hey peter nice to see you been a while thanks for uh, thanks for joining us from all the way out there uh melissa had another question here uh what's one six g what would that feel like so i went down to uh houston one time when the museum was getting a moon rock exhibit and i had to pick up the moon rock because they don't ship them you have to send someone down to bring them home so that was a pretty cool trip and while i was there i got to tour all the facilities and stuff like that and one of the th one of the things they have is basically it's like a jolly jumper it's a spring loaded contraption that you sit in and the springs uh tension basically removes five sixths of the gravity uh, that you feel and so the spring is sort of lifting you up and the net result is that you can sort of walk around and feel one-sixth gravity in your motion and it does feel really weird um, it does feel kind of slow motion because you don't fall as fast like if you if you jump or you you take a step your foot doesn't fall as quickly and um, it's very easy to sort of lift yourself up much more than you would have thought. And so you wind up sort of hopping from foot to foot and you get this sort of um, really kind of cartoonish um, method of walking. Um, it doesn't help with lifting things or stuff like that. It just gives you the sensation of how you can walk. 
but uh, it was it was pretty interesting. Um, I would say that it's something you would get used to, but um, you know, if you spent a lot of time on the moon, just like the astronauts get used to zero gravity, but it is uh, definitely an acquired skill because it was very easy to sort of um, like they had this this spring attached to a, tra a track on the ceiling, and so you couldn't really go that far. But it was very easy to wind up going sideways or spin yourself around because you're just not used to to working like that. Okay, so um, the latest that we've heard is that um, the Ethernet switch on that radar was replaced, and it turns out that the radar was not a tracking radar, as I had said. It's actually um, one of the methods that they communicate with the rocket in case they need to blow it up. Because they are launching from Florida and people live there, um, if something goes catastrophically wrong that the rocket is not going out to sea but turns around or something like that, they need the ability to blow it up. And this uh, radar is basically one of the systems that they use to control that. So it's a pretty important piece of gear. So they are just They've, they've swapped out the component. They're now doing the testing to make sure that that system will work. Um, and then um, launch director Charlie Blackwell-Thompson is uh, going to be polling the team uh, for their go and no-go after sort of that work is done. It looks like they have uh, filled up all the fuel tanks. So they've caught up on, uh, on the fueling issue, but now they're just waiting to make sure that that self-destruct uh, command system is still working. So that's where we are now. We're still standing, uh, standing by watching these uh, great images roll in. It, it really is a big, impressive machine. And, uh, oh, here they're doing interviews and things like that. Let's just see what, uh, what NASA has to say. So yeah. I'm sure there's some that maybe they haven't named, they're too small or we haven't explored them yet, but a lot of them already do have names. Like we're gonna be exploring the edge of Shackleton Crater as sure. part of Artemis mission. So a lot of them are already named and mapped. Yeah, thanks for throwing it back on me. I was like, I don't know. <laughs> do you think like our parents or, or husband or fiance are now upset that we didn't say them? I don't know, I mean, <laughs> I don't think so. Okay, not quite sure what they're talking about there, but uh, naming craters, it sounds like, I'm not sure. Um, so we are now in the launch window. So at this point, my little countdown clock is pretty worthless. We are now in the launch window and we have until 3.04 a.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. That's 2.04 Central and 8.04 um, in um, UTC, um, Universal Time, to launch. If they can't get things done before then, they'll have to stand down, they'll drain out all the fuel, they'll come back a couple of days from now. I think the next launch attempt will be on the 19th is the uh, next one. I don't have the time for that, but it's pushed l um, later in the time frame. So I think it's like four in the morning or something, even better than, than uh, our current one. But hopefully we won't have to worry about that. We'll just wait for... Um, launch director Charlie Blackwell Thompson to uh, pull the team and, and get everything together here. They do have these long um, launch windows for a very good reason so that they can have the time to do the, all of this kind of testing. And they did also um, improve the um, fueling timelines. They actually added in a bunch more time to begin with. So if they hadn't have um, sort of learned from their previous ones, we'd be even farther behind. But we're actually still um, in pretty good shape in terms of what, uh, what we'll be able to do uh, in this launch window. I think that the time should work out. As long as they don't run into any other problems, I think we should be able to see this get off the ground, which would be fantastic. One of the things that just came out uh, recently is uh, that they have announced, um, this was some of you may have heard of this already, that Canada will be sending a robotic rover to the surface of the moon. And uh, they, they just let the contract for that, for designing that uh, just this week. So Canada will be sending, um, designing and building uh, a lunar rover that will hitch a ride aboard um, 
someone else's rocket. We still don't have our own rocket uh, launch pads or anything like that that can get to get to the moon. But we have many partners, and uh, we will be sending our our rover to check out uh, and do science on the surface of the moon. So that's that's pretty cool. Um, and uh, we'll have to see. I, I think the timeline for that is not till 2025, 2026. Uh, but it's relatively quick because uh, Canada's pretty good at space robotics. And, you know, putting, to, putting together a, a rover like this with so many successful examples of what's, what's gone before, I think is, I won't say it's easy, but it's a straightforward kind of, kind of thing. They're actually just talking about some rovers over on NASA TV here as well. And so if we pop back here, they're talking about some of the upcoming um, missions that will support Artemis. So let's join them there. Lunar resources to inform future Artemis missions and a robust human presence on the moon. So we are, away, we are still awaiting a new T0 for today's launch attempt, but for more on what to expect when we launch uh, for this first day, let's go to NASA's Dan Hewitt. He's inside our Apollo Saturn 5 Center at the KSC Visitor Complex. Hey, thanks, Megan. Everybody, welcome back to the moon board. There's a lot of people here in the complex. I just heard a woo-hoo. People are getting in and out because we have a great view of launch when it's going to happen, and it's going to happen today. But that launch is just the first step in the Artemis 1 mission. So let's look at what's ahead for this historic first flight. As we just said, launch is step number one. Those four RS-25 engines throttle up, followed shortly after by the two solid rocket boosters igniting, sending SLS and Orion skyward. Now on our way uphill, we'll have a number of jettison events. You'll be able to see things coming off of the SLS rocket. One of the most visual ones will be these two solid rocket boosters. Now they'll expend their propellant a little over two minutes into the flight, they will separate. We'll see them flare off onto either side and then the core stage continues to fire. We're also going to see the launch abort system come off the top. Once you get high enough in the atmosphere, it's no longer required. You could actually do aborts using engines on Orion and its service module. I will also note that on the launch abort system, it's got those three solid rocket motors. The jettison motor is active the abort and the attitude ones are not for this flight. We don't have people, so we're not flying a fully active abort system. We also have three fairings that are there to protect Orion, the service module and the crew module, as we're flying up through the really dense parts of the Earth's atmosphere. Next up, we'll hit core stage separation. So we've got four main engines. We'll hear Miko, main engine cutoff. Those engines will shut down, the core stage will separate, drop away. It's eventually gonna splash down in the ocean. And that hands over the propulsion duties to this, our upper stage, the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage, or ICPS. Its first job is to execute what's known as a perigee raise maneuver. So the perigee is the lowest part of your orbit. You have a perigee that's your low part, and an apogee that's your highest point. We're gonna raise up the perigee and that's gonna actually put us in a nice circular path around the planet. And while we're there, that gives us time to check out Orion. We're flying it in space for the second time, the first time in this fully integrated stack with SLS. We'll be able to look at all of Orion's systems, make sure those solar arrays are capturing the sun's energy and turning it into electrical power for Orion systems, make sure the communications are working, all of our guidance, navigation, and control. That is your time to make sure you have a healthy spacecraft before you do something that is going to send it to the moon. And that's next up on our list. That's the translunar injection. For today's launch profile, that's gonna be a firing of about 18 minutes of that single engine on the upper stage. Now that engine optimized for a vacuum, it's producing about 24,000 pounds of thrust. So it's a pretty big engine and it's doing that because we need enough energy to be able to send our payload, Orion, beyond low Earth orbit and send it on a path to head out to the moon. Now, after that burn is complete, ICPS separates. It's going to do what's called a disposal burn. So it's going to send itself on a path from Earth around the moon and slingshot out into what's known as a heliocentric orbit. So it's going to completely leave the Earth-Moon system and go into orbit around our sun. 
But after it separates, propulsion duties get handed over to this, the European Service Module. And it's got a couple of different engines that it's gonna be using. And we're gonna be testing those out just on day one. We're gonna do what's called the Outbound Trajectory Correction Burn One. And we'll do a couple of these trajectory corrections as we're flying out to the moon. But that first one is that first critical test of this large engine, the Orbital Maneuvering System engine. That's the one that has the most thrust, generating about 6,000 pounds of force in a vacuum. And that's what's gonna be doing a lot of our maneuvers or giving us that pushing power as we do these maneuvers around the moon to enter into what's known as Distant Retrograde Orbit or DRO. And that's this dotted line that you see around here. Now we call it distant, basically because of the distance we're away from the moon, we're about 40,000 miles, a little bit less off the lunar surface. And then we call it retrograde because the moon orbiting planet Earth in this direction, going in a counterclockwise fashion, we're gonna be entering into a clockwise orbit around the moon opposite retrograde. Now to do that, we're gonna get in close, we're gonna dip in off the lunar surface, we're gonna be about 80 miles, 80 statute miles off the lunar surface as we do this outbound powered flyby. Again, the major thrust coming from that orbital maneuvering system engine. After we do that, we'll do a final maneuver to actually go into that distant retrograde orbit, that DRO. Now, why DRO? Why are we not just going around the moon and coming back on like a free return trajectory, which we did on some of the Apollo missions? Well, in DRO, it's a very stable orbit. It doesn't require a lot of fuel to maintain that area around the moon. So it gives you a lot of time to really test the spacecraft. If you followed with any launch of a new spacecraft, you know there's only so much testing you can do on the ground. Once you actually put all of that hardware in space, in the environment that it's gonna be operating, hundreds of thousands of miles away from Earth, you're gonna learn things you didn't even realize about everything from communications, the life support systems, the thermal control, everything on a spacecraft needs to get put through its paces in this environment before we put people on board. And that's why we're heading out to DRO. Eventually though, it's gonna be time to come home and we will do a DRO departure maneuver. This again, firing up that orbital maneuvering system engine and others on the service module. And this is what's gonna commit us from leaving the moon and heading on back towards earth. We'll dip in once more close off the lunar surface, slingshot and use the lunar gravity to do this return powered flyby. And then similar to the way out, we can make correction burns as we kind of fine tune our path back towards the earth. And then it's time for re-entry. A couple of things happen before that. One of the really critical ones, spacecraft separation. We're gonna detach the European service module shortly before re-entry, its job largely done. That burns up in the Earth's atmosphere and reveals on the crew module, the heat shield. I circled it earlier. This is goal number one of the Artemis mission. Artemis one mission is testing this heat shield at lunar return velocities because when we make that trip around the moon and we come back, we are going in speeds of excess of 20,000 miles an hour. So when we slam into the Earth's atmosphere, it's gonna heat that thing up to more, excuse me, more than 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, for the Artemis One profile, we're gonna do what's known as a skip re-entry. So basically you can come in too shallow and skip off the atmosphere to, uh, to narrow, and you're gonna do what's known as a ballistic entry, which really heats things up. We're gonna do kind of a mix where we're gonna skip once off the atmosphere and that we're still gonna get the heat, but that helps to reduce some of the G loads on the crew. Once you're through that, you get to parachute deploy. There's 11 parachutes in total that are going to uh, slow Orion down before it splashes down. We're gonna be going from 20,000 miles an hour to about 300 miles an hour before those parachutes deploy. And then they do a final job of getting it in the water in the South Pacific. We've got these big orange balloons, that's an uprighting system. So even if Orion landed in the water upside down, those can, those can inflate and they put us back upright into what's known as stable one. That's where you want your spacecraft to be, nice and upright in the water, especially if you're an astronaut in there floating. Now, we also have a large US Navy ship uh, with a big bay that's gonna basically come up and swallow Orion into its deck. And you've got a couple of other assets in the area to help recover hardware, the forward bay cover, parachutes, things like that. But that's scheduled to happen 26 days after a launch today. So that's 26 days from liftoff here in Florida 
around the moon to a splashdown in the Pacific, and that will be the first mission in the Artemis program, the farthest we've ever sent a human-rated spacecraft in history, and just the first step before we put people on board. So. Okay, so uh, we've got a couple of updates going on here uh, while they had that nice little segment. Um, so first of all, the, um, the rough calculation of when we might lift off is no earlier than 1.45 EST, Eastern Time, so 12.45 Central Time. Um, so pretty much right on the money from what I was uh, estimating before, but it's no earlier than that, so it could still go later. Uh, another thing is that um, apparently, well, back back uh, last week, a hurricane hit Florida, and they basically had to leave the rocket out at the pad, and so it had to withstand hurricane force winds. And there were a couple of pieces of the insulation that were loosened uh, or removed, and they had to basically do an evaluation of whether that was, you know, whether it was still safe to launch. And they they looked at the pieces that were missing. And um, it turns out that they, they, they're okay to go. They've just found another loose piece that seems likely to come off during, uh, during the launch. And so they had to do a quick uh, analysis to make sure that, you know, if it comes off during launch, what might it hit? Um, and what effects would it have with that piece of insulation being missing? Because as the rocket goes up through the atmosphere, you get friction and some heating and things like that as well. Um, and you don't want the, the wind sort of getting in behind things and stripping off more insulation and so on. So apparently that has been cleared. That's, um, the, the risk is, um, is minimal uh, from this particular piece of stuff. It's, uh, it's uh, sort of almost like a caulking. Um, it's called RTV, and it's around a sensor on, on one of the... Uh, um, on the exterior of the of the rocket. So those are the two things that have been dealt with. Um, we still don't have a firm launch time, but we are looking at no earlier than 1.45 Eastern Time, 12.45 Standard Time. We have another question here about uh, hydrogen. Um, hydrogen is the fuel for the Artemis spacecraft, and it is actually... Hydrogen is probably one of the most efficient rocket fuels um, because it's relatively plentiful and you basically get it by splitting water into its component parts and you get your, your fuel, hydrogen, and you get your oxidizer, oxygen, at the same time. So it's really, really cheap. Um, and it's got quite a bit of energy in it as well. So it's a very efficient fuel. The problem and the reason that it wasn't used this whole time um, well, you can think back to the Hindenburg. The Hindenburg was uh, one of those big balloons, a uh, Zeppelin, filled with hydrogen gas and one little spark and the whole thing burned up. Um, it can be dangerous to handle. It's very difficult to handle. Um, the hydrogen atom is the smallest atom there is, which means it's very easy for it to sneak through other atoms in, in a, a material and leak. We've seen that throughout the, the history of the Artemis program, actually. The hydrogen leaks have been the, the bugaboo that they've been tracking down, and that's because hydrogen is so small that it can kind of sneak through any little gap in a material, even at the atomic level. So that is, um, that's why it hasn't been used all the time. It was used in the, in the space shuttle um, for the, uh, the big orange tank was for the hydrogen and the oxygen, but uh, previous... Um, large rockets used, you know, various different other kinds of liquid fuels, which were easier to handle in some ways, but often either more toxic or less efficient or whatever. So hydrogen is a, is a really effective rocket fuel. And particularly when you start going to other planets, it's one of the more accessible things you can actually, you know, find it in, you know, on the moon in the form of ice perhaps even on Mars in, in large enough quantities that you could basically just, with a little bit of electricity, split that water into your fuel and your oxygen and uh, be able to re refuel your rocket in, in, uh, in sight. So that's why we're using hydrogen. And here's a great view of the business end of the SLS. This is a, this is a pretty impressive view. Down at the bottom in the middle there, there's, those are those space shuttle main engines. All four of those have flown before 
on various space shuttle missions, um, some of them as many as, uh, I think, a dozen times. So they're, they're well ready f for, their, uh, for their job. The two solid rocket boosters on the outside, um, on either side there, they are basically a uprated version of the ones used in the space shuttle program. Um, the little black bands there sort of d uh, are, are sort of dividing it into segments. And the, the space shuttle used four segment boosters and uh, Artemis uses five segment boosters. So, you know, 25% more fuel. Those are solid rocket boosters. And <clears throat> so it's, it's a, a solid material, kind of like a, like a sparkler. If you ever had a sparkler on your birthday cake or something, that's a solid fuel. And that's basically the kind of thing that's inside those. Um, and once you light them, you can't turn them off. So that's um, one of the reasons that the very top of the rocket there has the escape system. There's a, another solid rocket that can basically pull the crew capsule away from uh, if there's a problem. Because, you know, if you had a problem with an engine... Uh, space shuttle engine, you could turn off the fuel to that engine and it would turn off, but you can't do that with solid rocket boosters. So they are challenging um, and a little bit dangerous, but they are also a very efficient way of getting out of the dense uh, lower atmosphere and getting up into space. Here you can see the venting of the hydrogen and oxygen coming out of the, uh, the rocket, uh, the upper stage there. The uh, Orion spacecraft is under that curved cone near the top there, uh, where the uh, United States word mark and the flag is. And then the European service module, sort of the engine for the Orion spacecraft and the supplies and things like that, is in the white, con uh, white cylinder there with the NASA meatball on it. The escape or the emergency um, escape system is part of that cone right at the top, and then there's more that sort of sticks out of, the, out of frame here. And you can just see the, uh, the top of the orange tank there that uh, contains all the hydrogen and oxygen. We are still waiting for a little bit more information from NASA in terms of what they, uh, what they are planning to do here. We still don't have a, a, a new T0, but we are waiting for no earlier than, uh, I guess, about 20 minutes from now. Uh, and if they're going to do that, they'll have to start the countdown in about 10. Um, so there we go. Oh, Ben is saying, oh, yeah, I for, I'd forgot about the, uh, I'd forgot about uh, Barry Prentice, the whole, uh, the whole, um, hang on, I'll just turn off my earphone there. The um, idea of using blimps uh, as a, a transportation, especially to go up north, you know, with all the problems that the train has had with the per melting permafrost and there can't be roads all the way up to Churchill and things like that. The idea of using a blimp that could carry large cargo back and forth is actually, it's a brilliant idea. I've, uh, we've had uh, Dr. Prentice at, at the museum talking about uh, this program and it's one of those things that just doesn't um for some reason people just haven't bought into it i guess because it's it seems like it's old technology but it really isn't and in fact the the uh technology of sort of of the blimp or the dirigible the uh the zeppelin is uh has advanced a lot we'll, pro we'll probably be flying them in the clouds of venus in the next little while and so it makes sense to, you know, you use them here as well. That's a, that's a really good point, Ben. I'd forgotten all about that. Okay. There's people clapping. Yay. So at this point, um, we're just kind of waiting a little bit. So if you do have any questions about Artemis or about other things, feel free to uh, drop them into the chat there. One of the things that I did want to point out is that Canada's participation is um, going to be quite significant in the Artemis mission. Here's Canadarm3, an artist's conception 
attached to the Gateway Space, space Station, which will orbit the Moon, and which will be the gateway both to the lunar surface and then also eventually on to Mars. Because once you've got a space station far away from the Earth, but close enough that it's easy to get to, um, it's a perfect staging ground for uh, heading off to other places. If you want to explore a near-Earth asteroid or the planet Mars or other places in our solar system. So hopefully this will become a, quite a... Uh, a busy place in the next decade or so. And of course, our contribution of Canadarm gives us a wonderful chance to uh, send astronauts into space. I mentioned earlier, I, I'm, my money is on Jeremy Hansen, and uh, I guess I can tell you now, um, Jeremy Hansen's going to be in Winnipeg uh, at the Manitoba Museum coming up um, in November. Uh, the current date is November the 24th. If you're uh, on this broadcast, feel free to drop me uh, either an email. Actually, probably the best way to do it is an email uh, at space at manitobamuseum.ca and uh, tell me how many seats you want and I can hold some seats for you. It's a free presentation, but of course we've only got so many seats and lots of people want to see an astronaut. So... Um, just let us know, and uh, we'll put you on the list. It's one of the few perks that I can offer our Dome at Home family here. So definitely uh, just let me know. Um, current times, again, always subject to change, like everything from, uh, from NASA or the Canadian Space Agency, um, is November the 24th at 1 p.m. Uh, here at the museum. So you'd have to be in Winnipeg and able to come down here. But... Uh, that's the current plan. So drop us a line if you want to come to that, and I'll be glad to uh, set some space aside for you. Okay. It sounds like they are almost done the work that they need to do for the, um, the self-destruct system. Oh. Okay. So they're going to be doing a poll of the mission management team coming up. The, the launch director, um, Charlie Blackwell Thompson, will be polling her team to get the go and no go. And that usually happens five minutes or so before they start the countdown. So we could be coming up fairly soon to a resumption of the countdown. And um, we have this hold that has been extended, but it's a built-in hold here. Um, and uh, the reason that they have the hold here is that at from 10 minutes on, pretty much once you start any of that stuff, you pretty much have to go all the way. Because if you go partway into that 10 minutes and then have to hold again, a lot of things sort of get out of whack. So what they really try to do is, you know, get everything solved. And then the 10 minutes there is really, you want it to go just like clockwork all the way down to zero and you light the candle and you go to space. So to me, that indicates that if they're doing that poll now, which usually takes around five minutes or so, that gives us a potential launch time, let's see, of around, you know, 12.45, 12.48 maybe central time. We'll have to see uh, exactly how long that is. And of course, if there are any other issues. We haven't heard of any other issues. Uh, we did have the, the fuel leak earlier, which has been resolved. We had the uh, Ethernet switch that went down that has been replaced and, and, and they're now finishing the self-destruct testing. We had a little piece of uh, insulation, which they have evaluated as not being a a f uh, flight risk. The weather um, at last, last time I checked was 90% chance of still go. Um, the range is now go once that radar uh, was replaced. So this might actually happen. I, I have to say, you know, this is the fourth time through. I was getting a little, not jaded, but I was kind of thinking, you know, by the time I start the broadcast, they will have already canceled. Um, 
Okay, NASA test director Jeff Spaulding is reporting that there are currently no constraints to the launch of the Artemis 1 moon rocket. I think we might have something here. I'm going to bring up NASA's audio because I think that's going to give us the best information. Conduct the readiness poll, so we are getting close. We're going to pull up the audio now so that you can listen in. You go and rock. Rock is go. All right, copy all. And launch director NTD, our launch team is ready to proceed at this time. All NTD, at this time I will proceed with my poll. And attention on 232, this is the launch director performing the final poll for launch. Verify no constraints and go for launch. EGS program chief engineer. EGS program chief engineer verifies that the EGS, SLS, and Arroyan program chief engineers have no constraints and are go for launch. Copy, Greg. Thank you. EGS chief safety officer. The EGS uh, CSO verifies the SLS, Orion, and EGS CSOs. I have no constraints uh, and are go for launch. Copy, John. Come Thank here. you. Range weather. Weather has no constraints and weather is go for launch. Copy, LWO and mission manager. Look, Hollis, your uh, toy worked. George is here. And mission manager, launch director. Launch Director, Mission Manager on 232. The mission management team has been pulled. You have a go to proceed with terminal count and launch of Artemis 1. I copy all. Thank you. Oh, hey, Kim. And Entity, Launch Director. Go ahead, Launch Director. Yes, sir. On behalf of all the men and women across our great nation who have worked to bring this hardware together to make this day possible. And for the Artemis generation, this is for you. At this time, I give you a go to resume count and launch Artemis 1. Copy, Launch Director, and thank you. Well, there you hear it. We are go. And uh, for those of you that might have been watching, George made a quick appearance. Uh, our good friend Hollis from down in Connecticut sent him a little toy, a wonderful little moon that uh, he just loves, and I had it here on the desk, and it, it finally attracted him to, to get down here and say hi to everybody. So, we are about to pick up the counts, and we will be cutting, um, I'm basically going to leave NASA's stuff up here. I'll answer a few questions in chat, and uh, hopefully, we're just going to watch this happen. Getting ready to get that new T0 time. poll that you heard was the NASA test director's poll and all right and we have verified no cutouts at this time and all personnel we are going to resume the clock GLS you can resume the clock on your mark GLS copies countdown clock will resume on my mark three two one mark so we have some delay between the two different feeds that we're watching here but the count has resumed this is actually gonna happen I'm thrilled. We'll have to uh, see that everything gets all the way through here, but it's uh, it's pretty good, pretty good sense. Um, a lot of things happen really quickly in these last ten minutes. Um, okay, so one forty-seven or twelve forty-seven forty-four is the launch time I was just given. So, 1247 and 44 seconds. Um, basically, we wind up with a whole bunch of uh, things happening quickly. We have all the fuel uh, top-ups sort of stopping, and they seal off all the valves so that the, it's no longer venting, so that it's, it's full, basically. Um, they go to internal power and get all the batteries going. They get the... Um, at about uh, 33 seconds before launch, 
that's when the automated launch sequence kicks in because literally no human can do things fast enough to make it all happen. The computer takes over and um, about 12 seconds before launch, that's when they light off the sparklers underneath. That's to burn off any hydrogen that might have uh, leaked and pooled there because you don't really want a whole bunch of hydrogen sitting there at the bottom of a rocket. And then um, just about six seconds before launch, the four RS-25 main engines will start to light up. It takes them a few seconds to go from zero to full, uh, full power. And at T minus zero, that's when the solid rocket boosters ignite. And at that point, you're going. Um, so we are seven and a half minutes away. This is the closest that we have been so far in these four launch attempts. Fourth time is the charm, I guess. I'm going to bring up some mission control audio. Figuring ground systems for power transfer to the rocket. GLS is turning on cameras, recording video inside and outside the crew module to collect data for engineers. Purging the aft skirt booster with high flow nitrogen. Clear out any hydrogen gas that may be there. You can see the crew access arm is already retracted. When there is crew during Artemis II, it would happen at T minus six minutes. But out of abundance of caution, they went ahead and retracted the arm well ahead of liftoff. Want to point your attention to the base of the mobile launcher. If something wasn't done to reduce the power from the pressure caused by the rocket's ignition and thunderous sound, it could damage the rocket. So the ignition overpressure and sound suppression system will flood the mobile launcher with water. You'll see that sequence start at T minus 17 seconds. Now coming up in less than 30 seconds, the ground launch sequencer will start bringing the high energy systems online, starting with core stage pressurization. Fire room one is completely silent as they listen for the next call. GLS is go for core stage tank pressurization. The core stage tank is now pressuring, pressurizing to flight levels. The replenish valve to the liquid hydrogen tank now closing. The liquid oxygen tank will come a little later. Now we're arming your, the Orion Ascent pyros and transfer to internal power. The launch abort system or LAS jettison motor is now armed. On this flight, the abort motor is inactive because there is no crew on board. Up next is the flight termination system or FTS, which gives the Space Force the ability to destruct the rocket if it goes in the wrong direction. Let's listen in for that. GLS is go for FTS arm. The flight termination system is now armed. Coming up at four minutes and 40 seconds, a big moment. This is where the RS-25 engines and their bleed go to high flow. It's been a little tricky to dial in. GLS is go for LH-2 high flow bleed check. Good word, we've passed that. The cryo team got the LH2 engine bleed pressure loop dialed in. They are now at the right temperature for launch. Countdown continues. T minus four minutes, 15 seconds. Up next, GLS fires up the KPUs. Those are high speed turbines which provide pressure to hydraulic pumps that steer the RS 25s. Stands for core stage auxiliary power unit start. GLS is go for core stage APU start. That now leads to the thrust vector control test at T minus two minutes and 30 seconds. That can proceed now, and we will see 
the engine's gimbal at the bottom of the core stage. At T minus three minutes and 10 seconds, you will hear the go for purge sequence four. That's a helium purge of the four core stage engines downstream of the propellant valve, getting the air and moisture out. GLS is go for part sequence four. And in just a few seconds, GLS will close the core stage locks vent, liquid oxygen. The white vapor cloud caused from the super cold gaseous oxygen condensing the water in the atmosphere will disappear. You see it coming out there now. So there's there a delay goes, between the NASA locks and the closed. space Pressure flight rising now. Core stage um, locks tank to flight level feeds there's about 10 seconds difference coming up between the two in 15 so seconds look for that don't worry about that control actuator test engines will gimbal and there they go the four core stage rs-25 engines gimbling around testing the ability to steer the rocket into space They will operate at 109% performance, each RS-25 throwing down a half million pounds of thrust, all four, two million pounds, all together with the boosters, 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust. GLS is good for upper stage to internal power. Now the upper stage has gone to internal power. So power is removed from the rocket's upper stage, the ICPS, and it's been switched to battery power. The same milestone is coming up for the core stage at T minus one minute and 30 seconds. GLS is go for core stage to internal power. The rocket's core stage, which houses the three flight computers, is now Seconds on battery minute. power. So there is no more hold time available because there's no more margin on the battery. So if we hold, have a hold, we have to recycle back to team. Orion spacecraft and the launch control in Houston will take liftoff. control of the Orion spacecraft and the launch after liftoff. So I've jumped over to space flight now just because their uh, feed seems to be a little closer to reality um, in terms of time. They're about 10 seconds ahead of NASA. There's uh, 30,000 people watching here and 80,000 on NASA, so that's probably part and of there's it. There's the transition to automated launch sequence, sir. 30 seconds to go. Ignition of the four RS-25 engines is planned at T-minus six seconds. 20. We're going. There's the sparklers. Coming up. T-minus 10 seconds. Hydrogen igniters have fired. There's the sound suppression water system. RS-25 engine ignition. Booster ignition. <gasps> and liftoff of the space launch system, Artemis 1, on the way to the moon. Wow. Try not to wake up my family, but oh. <laughs> Five engines on the core stage and two solid rocket boosters now propelling the vehicle at 128 miles per hour. Space launch system arcing toward the east from Kennedy Space good Center. Con good control on the roll from T. 8.8 million pounds of ground so shaking far, thrust. Now 30 seconds into the flight of Artemis 1. First milestone will be for the vehicle to pass through Max Q at about one minute. We're and hearing nine a seconds into big launch. rumble here at this the press the site about four miles from the pad. On the rocket. <laughs> SLS now traveling 607 miles per hour. That's the one downside of a night view, of a night launch, is that all you see is the flames. It would be great You're to have footage of the rocket. Million pounds of maximum thrust quiet here in the loops in mission control. The four core stage engines are throttling down. Coming up on max Q max right Q. about now, which is the maximum pressure uh, as it goes through the uh, the atmosphere. Look at that. Now one minute, 21 seconds into the flight, traveling at 1,420 miles per hour. 
the yes, Black Tracy, Horse the uh, the George sighting broadcast. and the launch. It's uh, it is a good night. We'll have the to next do this major again. milestone will be for the solid rocket boosters to cut off and jettison at about two minutes and eleven seconds into the flight, so about thirty seconds from now. Again, quiet here in Mission Control Houston as teams continue monitoring. Hope you enjoyed the, the of sounds one. of the powerful solid rocket boosters on the space launch, the launch system. Space We're now Center, about twenty seconds from the expected burnout of the two solid rocket boosters and they will jettison to fall into the Atlantic Ocean. They will not be recovered Standing on this mission. Standing by for solid rocket booster jettison and shortly thereafter. There we go. There is burnout and jettison. Both solid rocket boosters have separated that the solid from... And that's basically what a space shuttle looks like except with one less engine. Four stage engines continuing to fire. Now the core stage continues that to power the flight of Orion, all six four so. RS-25 engines firing, traveling over 3,400 miles per hour, 46 miles downrange. <sighs> I can't believe it. Two minutes and 36 at seconds into the flight. Of rated performance, Hearing nominal expected. calls here in Mission Control Houston. We've still got four good engines on the core stage. Next up, we'll be looking for the service module fairing to separate. This is three 15 by 15 foot fairing panels. Providing really, NASA? Support You've got autofocus on your Those will separate camera? About three minutes and 11 seconds into flight, and very shortly thereafter will be followed by the launch abort system separation. Just over three minutes into the flight of Artemis 1, now traveling over 4,060 miles per hour, 83 miles downrange. We just had confirmation minutes, that the service module fairing has separated. Flight. We've heard confirmation from Mission Control Houston that the service module aerodynamic fairings have jettisoned. And that the launch abort system pyros have fired, separating those from Orion and as well. And we've heard confirmation from MCC Houston that the launch abort system motor, jettison motor, has fired. We just heard the call for three engine press, meaning if SLS were to lose an engine at this point in the mission, we could still achieve a nominal mission. We would just have an extended main engine cutoff time. However, we still have four good engines, all at maximum thrust right now, powering the first flight of Artemis at 5,200 miles per hour, 148 miles downrange. So we have another four minutes of uh, heading uphill here with the four, four main engines going. The flight. We're about halfway through the core stage's performance on this Artemis 1 test flight. No issues We're four reported. And 16. Yeah, everything is uh, going really well. The, uh, the main engine should cut off about uh, eight minutes and four seconds into the mission. And at that point, we're in orbit. Um, not a great orbit, not an orbit to the moon, but we're in Earth orbit, and then um, they'll drop off the big tank, they will um, deploy the solar wings and get all that done, and then about um, 50 minutes from launch, uh, 51 minutes and 22 seconds, they'll do another little burn, which is called the ICPS perigee rays burn, which basically means that you make your orbit more circular around the earth and you prevent yourself from sort of coming too close to the to the earth on your on the on the far side you've sort of gone up and you loop around the earth um and you don't want to get too low so that will put it into a nice circular orbit and then it'll travel back around to this side of the earth and i'm going to run outside and see if i can see it um all of our predictions are off um and actually um, the angle of the launch became less favorable for Northerners um, as the time went on. So we might not actually be able to see it at all. But uh, that all happens. Um, the TLI burn happens, um, let's see, starting at 1 hour and 38 minutes into the mission. So that's when we can hopefully see things um, happening. But everything is going really, really well. Two more minutes until main engine cutoff. Mission control is not tracking any kind of problems.
and this is pretty much what Mark Garneau's launch looked like in um, 2000, I think it was, STS-92, a shuttle launch, night launch. You had the big flames from the initial launch, the solid rocket boosters dropping off, and then you just had this sort of blue-green fl- um, rear-view flame that slowly got fainter and fainter and went down and down to- towards the horizon before finally disappearing. So we've lost our camera views because we're way out over the Atlantic Ocean. So they've gone to their animations here. There will be camera footage um, once the spacecraft is in orbit and once the solar arrays open and things like that. But we don't know exactly when that will come in. So we'll stick through here, through um, all the way through uh, MECO or main engine cutoff. Oh, good night, Daniel. Thanks for joining us. I got to say, I am just thrilled that this launch took place. Of course, there's 26 days worth of stuff to follow, and we'll be uh, following it in detail on my uh, personal page, Scott the Skywatcher. Uh, Apparently, uh, the museum has lots of other things going on as well, so I I don't want to totally blanket their page with, you know, hourly updates of space stuff. So if you want to join um, everything that's going on, I'll put, uh, well, it's Scott the Skywatcher on Facebook. Uh, You can also, of course, visit us. Um, You can reach me through uh, space at manitobamuseum.ca and I can get you uh, hooked up to everything. We just got the call for main engine cutoff. Artemis is in Earth orbit. We've had a good launch. Fourth time's the charm. We've had this wonderful uh, spacecraft is now up there. They're going to be doing a a burn in about 45 minutes to circularize the orbit. And then another burn in another 45 minutes after that to go to the moon. We're going back to the moon. And coming up in a year or so, a Canadian will be going around the moon. It all starts today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for those of you that I know have been with us for all the other launch attempts and things like that. It's great to see so many of you. Um, oh, hey, Bob. Hey, nice. Thanks for joining us. Um, so I'm not sure where the rocket will be, to be quite honest. I think if it, we had launched right at, at uh, 12.04, the rocket would have sort of been over in the general direction of the moon, just coincidentally, not because that's where it's supposed to be. Um, but um, it, I think it'll be a fairly bright moving satellite. And the way to tell is that um, right at, um, let's see, 138 into the mission, so you'll have to use the countdown clock here, it will do a a burn and so you'll basically see a sort of a cloud of material around it if that's the right thing i wish i could provide more information from that i'm going to go to the uh, nasa site and see if they've updated the orbital elements and if they have i'll post some details on scott the skywatcher of of where we can look that's my next stop and uh, yeah good luck trying to get to sleep hey dale that's totally right i'm uh, i'm going to grab my binoculars um and i'm going to go out heading um and see if i can see if I can spot this thing in the sky. Uh, If I can get some predictions nailed down, I'll post them. And uh, let's let's keep in touch. Join me on Scott the Skywatcher, and uh, I'd love to see your observations. I'd love to hear what you thought about the launch. And we will uh, be following this throughout the next 26 days, all the way to Splashdown. And I think we should plan a Splashdown party at the museum or something like that. That'd be pretty fun. Thanks again for joining us. Thanks to the Manitoba Museum for indulging my space uh, habit and allowing us to do these live coverages with Dome at Home. And thank you to all of you for joining us. Have a wonderful evening, and we'll see you again soon.